Okay, thank you to everyone who still has some staying power. We appreciate it um, because ProsQT offers a unique opportunity um, for all of us here at ProsQT to interact with the members of Software Preservation Network who've had um, the um, time and consideration to attend the workshop. So we want to, um, A, thank them for the work they're doing on Software Preservation Network. Also acknowledge that both projects are funded by IMLS. So we have mutual benefit by working together and figuring out how to best work together. Not only so we don't duplicate effort, but so that we enhance one another's outputs. Um, so you can find out more about Software Preservation Network online at this URL. And um, I'm going to uh, let Ian speak a little bit about the um, Software Preservation Network scope. You heard in Zach Bowell's remote presentation quite a bit about their working group structure. Um, perhaps, um, Ewan, if you want to um, give a couple of remarks about scope and then we'll um, head right into brainstorming. Sure. Well, for the context of this discussion, I think the most important thing to be aware of about the Software Preservation Network is that it's intended to be collaborative and involve as many partner organizations and individuals as possible. Um, SPIN is not yet providing anything in the way of services. We're very much just trying to coordinate the work around software preservation with the awareness, strong awareness, that a lot of these issues are better dealt with together than um, individually, especially things like licensing and um, archiving of objects that we're probably all gonna share, such as operating systems and um, proprietary software. Um, so, I mean, this is the defined scope so far. We're currently also working on um, mission, vision, and values, which should be coming out in coming months. But um, otherwise, I think that's, that pretty much summarizes what's going on there. Through the okay, so this brainstorming is virtual and you can log on if you access the slides from your computers, you can log on to the bit.ly slash presqt underscore virtual uh, Google Doc. So up on our screen, we see um, six brainstorming questions that we'll lead off with. Um, I'll ask the question to our audience and each of our panelists from their perspective, as well as those of you in the audience, please chime in. Um, and we'll uh, take notes in the Google Doc as we go along. Um, I'm going to start off um, in the middle with Sandra, because she's in the hot seat for PresQT. Um, how might software preservation factor into your own work or research interests? You're a computational scientist. You're also a member of PresQT. Um, what do you really need software preservation for? So, so I work on PresQT, obviously, but also on other projects like in the Science Community Institute. And as a computational scientist, I, I design projects. I have the proposal writing. And one part why is this interesting for me is really it comes from the funding bodies. So funding bodies are asking really for this data at the end of the project, they ask us how long we preserve it, what are the results. So this is one part. The other thing is that we have our survey, for example, and we want to have the results because we see available on so still in five years to be able to research it so that the raw data uh, we work mostly also with bioinformatic projects. Um, for example, next gen sequencing data is a big topic there. And the, the, on the one hand side, because it's really big data, on the other hand side, you get them only one time sequence. So you want the sequences still also available for all different analyzers in the future. So these are three examples where I really need that and that's important for me. And I've shown you the life cycle. And I want to do it from the beginning, not at the end of the step. And so one part of my own work and one part of the work of my partner, for example, biology, where I try to tell them, let's start at the beginning to really preserve the data before we come in three years, four years, five years in the situation. Oh, where's all the data? Oh, one is on my computer at home, one is on this disk, one is, no, I don't want to do that anymore. So, I would like to have that at the beginning directly, nicely prepared and prepared. Thank you, Sandra. Now I'm going to pick on Fernando because I know in your postdoc you've been working on this topic. So maybe you could share with us um, 
how does software preservation factor into your everyday work? Why is that your research interest this past year? Um, well, I will be talking about that tomorrow. So I don't <laughs> want to spoil it too much. But uh, so basically what I'm doing is trying to figure out how uh, software preservation fits into research data management. Um, so what kinds of things can we uh, you know, be capable as um, uh, you know, service providers uh, to help researchers on the exact issues you just described? Um, which is kind of like, you know, some come, coming up with resources, best practices for doing what you described, but also, you know, invariably people are still going to wait till the end. So what can we do uh, to help them in those situations? Yeah, I think that's a good observation. Anyone from the audience that would like to make a comment on question one, how might software preservation factor into your work or research interests? So, uh, I, this is Jake Carlson for our audience yeah, online. <laughs> I've spent a large part of developing the data with the data repository. And one of the challenges that we see is that software is usually a component of, of research data that we get. But you know, we've been talking today about software as if it's one thing, and it's not. I mean, there's different types of software with different types of sort of parameters, with different types of, of openness and, and proprietariness. And so all of these factors sort of really complicate our ability to preserve the data set, which we're, which we're you know, tasked to do, uh, if we don't have the software that's associated with the data set to make it work or understandable or whatever, that all kind of falls apart. And it's challenging enough to preserve the data that, that we receive. It's exponentially more challenging to preserve the software because of all these different factors. And we frankly, I don't think have the skill sets needed to really do this justice, to even understand like, what is a well formatted uh, JSON file takes a certain degree of expertise that you know, we don't necessarily have at, at ready at our hands in, in, in the library. So this is tremendously complicated for, for the work that I do. Right. Yeah, and I think you identified that in your talk earlier today about data curation network, understanding that individual libraries can't always fulfill the task for each phase of the preservation life cycle and that we might need to band together as a network and identify experts. Thanks. Um, now we're going to move on to um, question two. How can software, software collecting, software curation, software preservation, and software access be defined and how do the definitions matter? And I'm going to hand that one over to Nancy because she's an educator. <laughs> and uh, she's really big on taxonomy. Um, so when you um, put together something like data management training clearinghouse and you have to help audiences grapple with educating audiences about definitions and taxonomy, how important is it that we anchor um, use cases, descriptors, definitions to these terms? Well, it's, 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 it's critical because I mean, there, there are so many ways, as you say, of describing them and, 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 and using them. If they're, uh, and there are a lot of efforts, actually, to, to do that already. I mean, the, soft, the, preservation, the software preservation network, there are people doing it through data carpentry and software carpentry. Um, all, you know, if there's a common understanding of what the language is, or, or if there's, there are mechanisms by which you can uh, use a term and see what it, the relationship of it is to another term in another domain, then you know it's a, it's a much more a, a faster <laughs> way to really work together and collaborate, and you know make not the activities of preservation, but also the activities associated with collaborative uh, science, collaborative data creation, a lot faster. Because at least you know there are tools that are available that could be available, you know, if those standards are set up or those languages and relationships are set up that you know, technology can take care uh, of, of making some of that a lot faster. So, uh, and I know there are efforts. Right, we saw a little of that in Mike Hildreth's talk, where right. he showed how the high energy physicists were um, using PROV and some of the other uh, ontologies right. to better describe computational workflow um, portions and relationships, for right. example. Right, right. For provenance, Quality. I mean, yeah. there are lots of efforts to define a data quality mm -hmm. starting to happen in different venues. I know through NASA, uh, mm -hmm. different federal agencies are trying to come up with terms for doing that, taking them to WPC and, uh, you know, and, and, and come up
coming up with standards that way. That's a lot of work. That's right. And it's, it's a lot, it's difficult. The part, the, the most difficult part of it is making sure when somebody uses a term, you understand what they're talking about. <laughs> That's Does right. Be, I mean, it's, I forgot who had a presentation about that today, but you know, one term in one domain means something else it's entirely a different one. So right. the more we can, the faster we can come to that, the more we can talk about it. It may take a while to do it, but it's a good investment. A return on investment is that you can speed it up later on. Theoretically. Theoretically. <laughs> yes, true. Uh, so just a question for the audience. So is an ontology like Owl, or you mentioned Prob, Prob, is that software, or is that data? Especially important for those whose work involves creating such things. Matt Brown, and I question and say, is software data? Is paper data? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I mean, no, but there's a real research. Yeah, I mean, yeah. there's a real, that's a, a thing I've heard a lot just in talking to specifically like the data science community who say software is our data. It's like they're putting it in those familiar terms to get openness in a lot of cases where I've seen or to be able to kind of fight for the rights of software as a, as a first class research object. Um, that's a good observation. Thanks. Um, now we'll move on to question three. Um, what institutions, organizations, communities, individuals are collecting, curating, preserving, providing access to software, and what software are they collecting, curating, preserving, and making accessible? I know we can't create an exhaustive list today, but um, we have heard from several uh, organizations, funded efforts, um, communities, and individuals today during our lightning talks. Um, it might be um, good for us to think about among those we've heard from today, maybe who haven't we heard from, or um, perhaps um, one of our panelists would like to speak to, for Software Preservation Network in particular, um, who is a group that they need to hear from that they might not be hearing from yet, and vice versa for PresQT, what can we do to help make sure that all communities are Software Preservation Network aware? Um, would anyone like to take that one up? I, one thing I would suggest is that there are uh, NSS Earth Cube has a number has created a number of what they call research coordination networks RCNs that are uh, sort of collaborations of different kinds of uh, earth science domains that are trying to talk about the tools that they have available and from different research projects understand how they can be used together and uh, and to extrapolate to some sometimes what they're doing is extrapolating how that can you know turn into a standard not necessarily but that's really not their main focus but there's one there are some related to uh, deep ocean and uh, I think cryospheres as well the there was a yes and carbon um, um, deep carbon and um, also uh, uh, what are the um, so anyway, those are, those are there, the, the RCNs are available. You can do Google searches for you know, research RCNs and, and uh, through Earth you can find the different networks and usually they have the tools that they're working with. So right. um, I also think that um, tech companies have software that they're developing that is often very interesting and a lot of them go out of business before they really get very far, but that information might still be valuable to somebody else. And I don't think that, I mean, I'm not an expert on software preservation network, but I don't think that anybody's talking to them about it. I mean, is there a way to embargo their software so it can't be shared until some time goes by or that's an interesting observation. Thinking of proprietary software too, because they probably won't want to share that and like if they're on their last leg out and they might sell out that one. I always think of the gaming community when I think of software preservation, mm -hmm. only because I have Sonic or Sega Genesis on my phone. Um, and that was only made possible by like a group of very enterprising gamers. Um, so when I think about like providing access and making things open, my my mind always goes first to this community who kind of um, 
I don't say pioneered emulation, but um, really took off with it for their for their own use. And um, I think it's really enterprising and great. And I think that gets to the juxtaposition of thinking about the curator's activity and software preservation as curation of files rather than provision of emulation as service. And I don't know, Yuna, if you'd like to comment on that or save it for tomorrow. But um, when we think about software preservation network and how um, it interacts with various emulation communities, I think that's really important because just as Nancy pointed out with the RCNs being kind of particular in disciplinary niches, so too does emulation seem to coalesce around communities of users who still want to play whatever, right? Um, there's a reason that people want to keep using something. Or, or data is the same with the emulation drive. The, the tools that we need as well, yeah. That's, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, any uh, comments from the audience on that one? I guess there's a lot of like, small communities like people who do digital embroidery. There's really a very small number of them. So the software isn't updated very often, but when it is updated, you can't you often can't use the old files unless you have the old version. So I think there's a hobby community too that might be served. <coughs> almost like a maker community yeah. in a way. Yeah, yeah I agree. Um, let's move on. Oh, Helen. For our audience, this is Helen Huckshoe. Okay, so I, I used to work on the British Library and this discussion reminded me of a project we did with the National Video Game Archive in the UK. So it was really a, it's a small project. Uh, it, it was a collaboration between the British Library and that uh, video game archive. So the, just, the division of labor works mostly like this. So the video gamers, they, are they were encouraged to come forward to, to give the archive um, hardware, code, and whatever they have in possession. And the British Library's role is actually to go to the website. They, set up at the time to promote or download that piece of software and to archive as much as we can and work together, that was seen as the best approach to archiving some of the video games. Um, but I have to say the idea was great and it worked in some places, but in some cases the web archiving bit was very unsatisfactory because you know it depended on how the website is constructed and what happened. Quite often, you have an impression of, of how it looks like, but it makes sense to bring it all together. But if we did them separately, I don't think we would have done a less good job. Oh, that's an interesting observation. Thanks. I think the, I think the main point of this conversation is that it's not that it's That's right. That's a good one. I'll put that in the notes for bullet two. <laughs> um, so moving on, um, the million dollar question for PresQT, how can the quality of software preservation be assessed? And how, I'm going to add on to that a little bit, how can the quality of uh, software preservation um, be uh, logged, managed, improved um, with the kind of tools we've been talking about? Um, any panelists want to take a first stab at quality of software preservation and how you might measure it, record it? Well, I'll, I'll just say that uh, at least for both what I'm doing at Hopkins and for the Software Preservation Network, uh, this question is highly relevant. Um, so uh, at Hopkins, you know, we're not really, we're taking in some software and archiving it, but we're not really evaluating if it actually works, uh, if it does what the researchers say it does, uh, says it does. Uh, so having having tools to do that is something that you know would make the service provision aspect of it uh, you know, scalable in the future. Um, for the software preservation network uh, work that I'm doing, um, this is exactly the question for my working group. We're calling it the software curation readiness. This is what we're trying to answer. Um, so we're at, we're at the beginning stages of, on uh, we've collected some use cases from our current numbers and. What we 
we've been trying to do is uh, for each of our use cases, just articulate what, like what we think would be good to do um, for making our particular example uh, more duration ready, which means that if you were to take this <laughs> software and deposit it into an archive, the, the quality of that uh, deposit would be improved by, by following these steps. Um, so, and, and we're going to put this out to the community to, to see what people think, if they agree or not. Um, and, and collect all sorts of use cases that hopefully we'll, we'll at the end, what we'll be able to do is uh, find commonalities across these use cases so we can you know, come up with something uh, as, a, as a guidance, so to speak, for service provision. Yeah, so, I was going to add to that also the some ideas. We had also the, the test to see from the beginning, and we hope to get many more of us to say, of course, we have to preserve the quality and have metadata. And software should be able to run, of course. So, but then we have to have the whole environment at least. And so, what is, for example, and this was one of the ideas that comes now from, from what you, you looked at, might be you could have software viewers also. Is there a new word? Really, editor. So, we didn't really think about that, I think, mm -hmm. at the beginning. So, that would be a great idea if we do work together, like your contact, the editors, for yeah, maybe the definitions, but if we could even have that for data and software, that would be great. That would require, require like ICPSR level resources, <coughs> yeah. which is a lot. That's a, that's, yeah. That has to be funded to be sustainable and to scale. At least, yeah. I mean, so I always, I mean, ICPSR is a very good model for social science because they have like a full staff of these curators. So if any, if, I mean, the, the quality of preservation question is important because none of us have that full staff of curators. So um, I know Daniel Nist on the O2R project is, has integrated Bagot into his tool, which is basically like you give them an R markdown file and they give you a Docker file and they have some Bagot integration to basically just like check some their package. Um, but I think that's one really basic way mm -hmm. that at least the quality of these like little packages can be assessed, but that's at like a bit level. So when we think about moving up higher and abstracting, um, that I think that's just a, a resource question more than anything else. I, guess, I mean, my question for this is what type of quality? Because we talk about best practices, if I'm writing a program I mean, a programmer should be putting in notes and things inside while I'm writing my code, you know, to be best practices. That's good quality code. But then another case is, does it run, does it produce the results? So there's lots of different levels the quality, you know, of software can, can be judged upon. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, in the digital, uh, I'm sorry, cultural heritage and, me and medical field, there is a concept of levels of service that's associated with how much curation you provide to different kinds of data based on your own mission in your own organization, but could also then be extracted to some extent in, with the, in a cooperative environment to extend that to, to software as well as data. So, in the Library of Congress, has the preservation or the has the preservation levels of. Uh -huh. How, how much preservation and how much attention do you give it? In the essay level? In the essay level. Rick, did you have a comment? Yeah, so the that levels of service, I think, applies exactly to that second question with the different definitions of collecting, curation, preservation, mm -hmm. access, very much getting into the, the intention of what you actually want to do with it. So, so if you just want to store the bits, right. maybe that's good enough. But if you want to make it accessible for say it is the domain that's already using it okay then then you may need to just document a small amount but if you want to make it accessible for another discipline for example then that requires much more documentation around even what kind of research it is what the intention of the software is explaining some of the actual uh algorithms etc even even further uh and, and, and of course, all of those, so, so again, it really comes down to that level of service that you're talking about, I think, of how much you would actually apply. So, so the, that, I, I agree, that is, that is a 
way to measure the level of quality depending on what the intention is. And maybe maybe that is different for everything, but determining that up front is probably pretty important. And I'm sure we have to explain that for the fact that it's seen for the final design, which level we, we really want to deliver in the design, how much we can do with the software itself and automatic tests. That doesn't mean that we cannot suggest that the next level would be great if project apply for funding or something to have more curators, to have more or a higher level of quality. Well, it has to be a, a distributed solution. Yeah, exactly. it makes, yeah. You can't, yeah. and not one institution can do oh, no, it. It no, has no. to be the solution for the that kind of assessing quality yeah. really yeah. needs to be a community wide solution. Yeah. Should, should the publication process uh, involve software? QC effectively. Perhaps. Good question. Sure. I think that's asking a lot of people who provide free labor to money makers. <laughs> like publishers. I mean, just this like when you look at the review process already, I wish it was better. Um, but like I I think adding quality assurance for software is a is a lot to ask of this system. The only way, the only way I've seen it as effective is in the Journal of Open Source Software, where that's their only goal is to just uh, like do QC for code. But in like a domain-specific publication where people have produced like an application based on their research, I think that's. Um, I would love to see it integrated, but I'm skeptical. I guess. Maybe it needs to be split off in those domains as well, so yeah. they have publications for software and. Then you have to have it published there before you publish the publication that talks yeah, about it. I'd be so into that. I think there's the Journal of Research Software is another one that might be a domain agnostic. That might be a good first step as well. Um, I think about getting into that, but I think that's a I think that's an excellent model. So perhaps a corollary question here is what are the incentives for people to invest time and effort into doing software education from the very beginning? Um, throughout the, the life cycle, so that it isn't that consumer at the end. Because the, the system we have now, I you know, realize it's not ideal for doing things above and beyond sort of a narrow definition of, of publishing and papers that we've done something. I think the same arguments for data curation can be used for software curation, yeah. like almost one to one. <laughs> and especially for openness as a part of that. We have great answers there. <laughs> I have great answers, making stuff available, but <laughs> but unfortunately, it's not that simple. Right. Um, this question is for the audience. You can ask any panelist. Um, what questions do you have regarding any aspect of software preservation? <laughs> I'm going to start with Jake and then go to Jay. So we, we've had uh, a little bit of coverage on this today, but uh, intellectual property around software, I think, is potentially challenging when it comes to preservation. Do you even have the ability and the, the authority to be able to do these things that we're talking about? Yeah. I, I've got a few different answers. Uh, one is there is a grant that was just um, announced, I think, I think it's been announced, um, that's providing um, money to look into fair use. And there, there are a few people, I'm a little skeptical, but there are quite a few people that seem to think there's some opportunity with you applying fair use to software in order to be able to access old content. Um, there's a group called, uh, what's it called? Elixir? No, and it's part of the uh, United Nations uh, Persist. <laughs> the Persist project is trying to tackle intellectual property um, issues related to software preservation at an international level. Um, I'm also, I think they might make progress, but it'll probably take them a very long time. And then we're also looking at it in the software preservation network and um, with some of the technologies we're using like emulation as a service that opens up new technical ways of controlling access to software, but providing access as well, so that you could potentially have um, a centralized service offering up proprietary software for, um, for research and um, nonprofit usage. Another group is the RBA interest group, which is writing you on software. They're also looking at policies and licenses. And so they want to tackle this problem, they just have it. So. Jane? Is the Software Industry Association involved with SPN at all? We've, we've been in contact with some of the software vendors. We haven't had a lot of success yet with like the Business Software Alliance, but some of their members we've, we've been talking about. 
I'd also say for in a research context, at least when we um, what we have, if we want to have a starting place in terms of like IP, um, GitHub is a really easy licensing, and you can filter on licenses, and there's a range of permissive licenses or not. So um, someone here asked me if they could preserve repros it. And I was like, it's a BSD, like go forth and love. Um, and I think, you know, at least looking at open software and at least using that as a start is really good. Um, Which I think there's a difference people who use the open software. Uh, right, yeah, that's that's a whole other suite of questions. Yeah. But at least from a preservation standpoint, I think there's there's a lot there that we could leverage. There's um, a whole path of more so. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the problem with preserving proprietary stuff, at least when I've done stuff with Represent, so I packed MATLAB with Represent, but I can't unpack it. There's like some secret sauce in the proprietary code that just like won't even let me point to another license file. You know what I mean? Like it's very, like can only be used on this one laptop. Um, so I think in a research context, I think you're right. Step one, like, move people off of these unpreservable platforms and then i think from there even just looking at the ip the licenses are fairly permissive in the open source community so i mean the only real problems that i think ip uh, runs into it is these proprietary forces and if you with an ip i know algorithms and things and technology they want to put patents on them and which is going to make people not want to share and make it either proprietary. I mean, even more so than data. So that's that's one big stumbling block. Is you know they want the recognition, they want the patents, but then yeah, how do you change the mind that open is better? Well, the patents are for a limited time. So if they're not open, then you can just wait until it's over and grab it then. That's one mechanism. Another mechanism, and there's some amount of uh, online help available on this. Um, when uh, you start looking about, is that um, free and or open source doesn't mean that you give up your intellectual property rights. Right. You can still retain them, defend them, and monetize them if uh, you have um, commercialization or uh, intellectual property rights that you want to assert inside that uh, spectrum of, of what is free, what is open, and they don't even always have to be coupled. So you can have open source software that you charge for. You can have uh, open source software that you assert rights over. Um, that doesn't mean others won't reuse it, repurpose it, and or be better able to develop instruments against it, to develop interoperable platforms against it. So there are reasons why in free open source software, um, we choose that route so we will have more users, so we will have a more commercializable um, platform or a um, more interoperable platform. So I, I don't know, in the context of software preservation network, how exactly to define the utility of, of those divisions or those stacks of audiences. But um, our final question, and we've got one more, Ben. So something that worries me is that it's true that we can have binary blocks, that we can, we can have packages. Uh, I don't know how it's useful for that. So I can have a binary program that reads my data, that, that helps me, right? But if I'm going to process that data with a program, and I don't have idea if it has to be correct or not. That that's not useful, and that's not right. So that 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 part worries me. Uh, it's true that we can have all these different artifacts, but that's not going to help me in my science. Maybe I can run the same data that the other person used, corroborate that I have the same output. When I put my input, I have no idea what is coming from, and, and I, I I don't think that's worth pursuing. Uh, it, 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 yeah. That's got to be a, an iffy assessment part, right? Um, yeah, I agree. So you're talking specifically about proprietary versus OSS? No, no, even, even, not, not, even not the source. I can have the source. If I don't have the, the mathematical proof of the algorithm, 
That's not helpful. Right. It's one of the nice things like of mathematical proofs. Right? Like you read them and you know which inputs are good, which inputs are bad, and where it breaks. You give me the source of something. But unless it was, it was written by Donald Knuth, right? Because you have the proof of every <laughs> step. <laughs> <laughs> some value or, or yeah. you, you can't predict the future and preservation is all guesswork but yeah. we at least need a framework or, or a means to ask some serious pointed questions about yeah. is this worth devoting resources to that. I'd also say if it serves the majority of users it's worth preserving regardless of, of whether or not those users necessarily understand the secret sauce. Um, no, which is a conversation in and of itself is how is how are we educating scientists and how, and how or researchers and how they use these tools so i think you represent a, a subset of users that don't represent the majority when you ask these questions i, I just got worried there is somebody using a hammer that they don't understand and, yeah. and they are going to say hey look i, I really like this since now well yes but that, that may not mean anything it might be noise that you process um, and if you don't if you don't have the proof of that program it, it does have a this should be included in the review process if they do a publication on that. Someone should pick up that they've used something that they can't explain, therefore it's not science and therefore it shouldn't be published. But I, I, I think that, that you mentioned that, uh, that somebody mentioned maybe not you, that is uh, uh, helping encourage people to do these things is that that program has to be part of the science. Right? It's not just a tool, but it's part of the scientific process. Uh, and if you don't have that, if you don't, if you don't tell me your sensor, how your sensor works, then that paper might not be as useful. Right? But those results are suspect. And yeah, I can reproduce your outputs from your input. That that doesn't that doesn't advance anyway. For your career, the garbage in, garbage out. Yeah, because yeah. 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 I can't look at statistics. I mean, that of all the uses that I have created. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but it's the same. You can always wander around. Number, so they have to be, as you already said, you, you have to be very careful then. That they are not in two years somewhere, that you have really good process. And nobody uses the tools anymore because it's like, oh, and, and, and mm -hmm. uh, you cannot trust the process anymore. Because when they use the trust at the beginning, it's hard to get it back. That's true. Yeah, yeah. yeah I think, go ahead, One of the we're talking about right now is the, the difference between you know, the presentation of those statistics and having the source data to generate an identical presentation, is that the same as having to preserve the software you use to create that representation? Because in some cases, going to the source data is enough if we have enough metadata about that data. And we don't necessarily need to know exactly how those bitmaps or, or that, that visualization was created. Um, but it's useful to have that output product too, right? So. Which parts of that pipeline are essential to, to make sense of this data in the future and bring it forward, and which parts uh, aren't? Really, that's right. my question. And it might be different for different journals or different yeah, for different funders or different for different yeah, disciplines. Like the level you're talking about for rigor is essentially have to being able to re-implement an algorithm and, and compare sure. almost Monte Carlo style. But a lot of what a library does is just providing access to a useful tool. We don't have to prove that it's correct. We just have to keep it available as a useful tool sometimes. So there's a lot of difference in the rigor there needed. Sorry. Um, 
just being kind of negative the whole day. So like we have been talking about like disturbing stuff like containers and for emulation. Is that really like a viable long-term thing? Like in 50 years, like we, we still need to throw the emulator itself. Like like those are going to change or possibly we're going to be having to do format migrations on whatever we're preserving. Should we look at just it's good enough just to keep just to keep enough uh, context so that way, like those the, the video gamers people in the future can reconstruct it if they care enough. But maybe we don't make guarantees that they can just like, run it as is. I mean, um, that's not oh, sorry. The timeline of or lifetime of software is much shorter than for data. I totally agree to that. So five years ago, nobody worked with Docker. Maybe in five years, nobody works with Docker anymore um, because there was something novel, fantastic. Um, we have, therefore, we have to preserve more than only the software. We have to preserve the ideas and the algorithms and the methods. And we have to go a step further. That's also my impression. We, we cannot stick to the real software packages or think to them because in five years, 10 years, we probably won't use them anymore. Ellie? So I just, just to follow up on that, uh, I've, I've been introduced to a bunch of technologies uh, at the containers workshop last year and at this workshop, especially with regards to runtime environments for, for these containers and data like whale, whale tail, or whatever it is. Similar problems exist right in the repository space where right. you've got a Fedora instance and you put some data in there, and you know that Fedora instance can go away just as readily as the other of these middleware platforms. But these middleware platforms are very complex and potentially expensive to maintain. I just feel like they're higher risk because they're more complex. So, right. I, yeah, I, I think I, modularity I think, and interoperability are key because the modularity buys you the ability to um, not only migrate forward as other tools evolve, um, but also to plug and play with what you need for your use case or your discipline or your stack of tools, whether you're a data manager or a scientist or um, someone who is planning forward with ReproZip and wants to make sure that if Docker goes away, ReproZip still does well, what it needs to. That's the point of the design right. of the package in a lot right. of ways. Like, and Remy, correct me if I'm bound to mess up in here, but it, we've designed it, uh, Remy designed it to be pretty generic um, in that, like you said, if Docker goes away, you can write an unpacker for something similar and it's, it's trivial. Um, we have someone writing it on, on an extra unpacker right now on GitHub to just add in. Um, and that's because we collected extremely detailed technical administrative metadata, but it's not tied into a platform. And I think that genericness is important for forward and backwards compatibility. And I think, I mean, the point of us coming to these meetings is not just to show you represent, but to interoperate. Um, this new unpacker came out of Daspos, for instance. Yes. Um, so I guess, I mean, I think it's absolutely key. Right, but, but my concern is, you know, I've, I've been given a DOE by this, by this middleware, and I've cited it in my publication. What happens in 10 years or five years when somebody tries to click on that DOE and that runtime is no longer there? Yeah, that's a good question, actually, yeah. actually to continue in Ruth's brainstorming tomorrow. And in the interest of time, I'm going to close us off because we only have a half hour before dinner. Um, but our last question, are you interested in getting involved with Software Preservation Network? Um, I ask each of us and thank our panelists, Vicki Steves from ReproZip, um, 
Fernando um, from Hopkins and the Clear Fellowship, Nancy um, from Knowledge Motif and ESIP, Sandra from PresQT, and Yuan um, from uh, Software Preservation Network for this um, panel and um, in his uh, professional context at Yale, we think about how um, each of us gets involved with PresQT or Software Preservation Network by continuing to ask these other questions, just like Elliot's. And if you go to the next slide, you can go there and sign up for the newsletter or um, sign up and say you want to become a, a more active member of the network. That's so. softwarepreservationnetwork.org slash contact. Thank you, Yun. And we appreciate everyone for the brainstorming. Um, thanks for coming today.